Welcome to Radical AI, a podcast about radical ideas, radical people, and radical stories at the intersection of ethics and artificial intelligence. We are your hosts, Dylan and Jess. In this episode, we interview Yeshi Milner, the co-founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. Raised in Miami, Florida, Yeshi began organizing against the school-to-prison pipeline at Power U Center for Social Change as a high school senior. There, she developed a lifelong commitment to movement building as a vehicle for creating and sustaining large-scale social change. More recently, Yeshi was a campaign manager at Color of Change, where she spearheaded several major national initiatives, including Organize4, the only online petition platform dedicated to building the political voice of Black people. In our interview with Yeshi, we talk about data for Black lives, what it is, why it matters, and how people can take action to respond to current events. We want to personally thank Yeshi for her leadership and vision for an equitable world, using data as a tool for social change. And without further ado, we are so excited to share with all of you this interview with Yeshi Milner. Yeshi, thank you so much for taking the time today to come and chat with us on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Can you start off by maybe explaining a bit about what Data for Black Lives is and really what motivated you to found this organization? Yeah, sure. Um, Well, Data for Black Lives, we're a movement of scientists and activists. And our mission in like very brief terms is to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. Um, And we do that in a number of ways, um, you know, through movement building activities, through political advocacy, through research and You know, we started Data for Black Lives in November of 2017 with a conference at the MIT Media Lab. But really, a lot of the inspiration and the drive and the vision around the work um, came from, you know, started for me as early as high school. Um, The very first time I ever even collected data was after some young people um, that I knew that I went to elementary school with and middle school with, but went to another high school that was technically my home school, according to my address had organized a peaceful protest actually in response to a vice principal putting a student in a chokehold. And, you know, this was like 27, 2007, 2008, you know, we had like phone cameras, but like the, the, the images were very grainy. Um, but yeah, students, you know, kind of trying to lean on nonviolent tactics and practices and that philosophy said, okay, this is really the straw that broke the camel's back. Let's organize this peaceful protest. Let's all convene in the cafeteria. Again, I went to a different school, but, you know, I knew people who went there. My sister had gone there and had a few best friends. And, you know, um, sadly, um, instead of the school district, the school principal, the city of Miami, um, recognizing what these young people were doing as like being leaders, you know, having their voices heard, they actually ended up sending in SWAT teams, police cars, dozens of police cars. And it was insane. Like I remember being at home and watching on CNN, like students riot at Miami Edison senior high. And if anybody's listening, you can actually go on YouTube right now and just Google Edison at like riot, riot at Miami Edison. And you'll see the video. It was crazy. I mean, literally like hearing about what was happening, you know, seeing the, seeing the damage, like people, like young people that I went to elementary school with being slammed against police cars You know, I was just like, wow, like unless we found other ways of getting our voices heard, you know, that could, yes, direct action and protest absolutely is important. Obviously, we're in a moment now where it's important. But, you know, we like unless we did that, like our lives, especially for young people, like would continue to be under assault and at stake. And, you know, I um, got involved with an organization called Power You Center for Social Change, and we um, hit the ground running and um, surveying um, students, right? We, we we asked over 600 students about their experiences with arrests, with suspensions, um, with police brutality in schools. And we actually turned those findings into a comic book. And, you know, our thing was that we were pushing to end the school to prison pipeline, which is uh, defined as like uh, practices and policies that uh, criminalize young people, 
Um, and, and it's really this thing of like, okay, you know, things that like used to be solved with a phone call home, <laughs> you know, people getting literally kicked out of school for expelled or even worse arrested. And, you know, um, it was amazing to even survey other young people my age who were dealing with the same things as me and literally seeing like the light bulb go off in their head. We're like, oh, I'm not a bad kid because I got suspended or I was sent home for not having my school ID or, you know, not having, um, you know, having the wrong color t-shirt under my uniform because of like gang prevention laws or whatever that, that you know, like said that like, if you had like different color, it was, it, it, it's crazy, anything to criminalize. And anyway, so, you know, really realizing that no, like I'm not bad necessarily at, or at all, right? Like this is a, this is a citywide problem. This is a statewide problem. It's a national issue. It's all, and it's called the school to prison pipeline. And most importantly, there's groups and there's people in the city and in this country that are working for solutions such as restorative justice, which is what we were pushing. And, you know, it took us a while. It wasn't until I w came back to Miami after college that we got some traction in getting restorative justice implemented in the schools. But, you know, it was amazing to see this comic book that we made, right? As a way to make this data accessible and impactful, um, like literally travel the world, like travel the country, like be students in communities in St. Louis and in, and in, and in New Orleans and in Oakland and in Denver who are facing some similar policies. Again, these, these were national policies, Clinton crime bill type stuff. Um, who also didn't have any data to talk about it, really being able to use it um, for their own campaign work and their own organizing. And anyway, um, after, like that was my senior year, I then went to college, I went to Brown and my whole focus in college was to get as many skills as possible in data collection, research, biostats. I mean, I like hustled my way into like all of like the graduate level classes just because I was like, there's a, such an urgent need on the ground in my community for these kind of skills, especially in a place where we're systematically disenfranchised, have no political power. How can we elevate some of these issues, whether it was school, you know, school to prison pipeline, police brutality, gentrification, whatever. And I graduated from Brown. I went back to Miami um, and went back to the same organization. But this time I had a whole other opportunity um, and was very different, right? I had I had been asked to come on at the very end of a campaign that had been going on for four years. Um, that the organization Power You, we were in a financial peril. We were we almost had to close our doors. Like a lot of black led organizations that were doing work at that time. And our last grant was around this grant around um, um for Barbara Wood Johnson, um, and it was funding a campaign to address black infant mortality and. You know, our way of thinking about it was looking at breastfeeding as a form of racial justice. And, you know, women in the community, families knew that, you know, black babies were three times more likely to die before their first birthday. And we knew that, you know, even though like research, you know, at large was saying that it's hard to understand why a black mom with 14 years of education has like lower like has like worse maternal health outcomes than a white mom with like with like a high school education but like we knew right and i think one intervention point was in the hospitals our public hospital was the largest public hospital in the country by beds and you know everyone knew that if you sent your 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 family members in to go have give birth a lot of times they wouldn't even come back out alive just because of how you know it was a really racist and often brutal environment whether it was the overuse of procedures like cesarean section versus natural birth or, you know, aggressive marketing of infant formula after birth, all these other things anyway. So it was a similar situation. You know, I had no idea that breastfeeding and, and infant formula was so political. I was 22 and I was a feminist, but I had no clue about any of this stuff. It was such a learning curve. But, you know, I kind of relied on these skills that I had where I said, OK, you know, part of this grant is for us to finish this survey. We surveyed only 300 moms and asked them about their experiences in hospitals, including our public hospitals. We, you know, were able to to work with data scientists at Loyola Marymount University, um, who do participatory action. And while I was on the ground and, and leading research, having that extra capacity to to run regressions and do important analysis, I wrote a report called a call, a call for Birth Justice in Miami, and we got like one Miami Herald article, but that was enough, right? Literally after years, and certainly before I came on of even trying to get the hospital's attention, you know, we were able to get a meeting and they totally revamped all their policies, even fired staff, changed their whole, changed everything, accepted all of our policy recommendations and demands. And 
And, you know, let's be real. Like, you know, I couldn't, you know, maybe I couldn't bring in 300 black moms and, and Latino moms and, and poor moms into the meeting with me in the hospital CEO and staff, but they couldn't deny the data that they collected. But I think most importantly, like, you know, it's important to say that if, even though, um, you know, um, it shouldn't have taken three, that like even that, like one baby dying should have been enough for them to take action. But, you know, either way, it was really important for me to see how really rigorous and, you know, powerful community level data collection research, but most importantly, organizing leadership development and a whole slew of strategies and tactics were, are, were, were so impactful in moving the needle on an issue that is still having like amazing, you know, results and having an impact today. And, you know, after Miami, my, my experience in Miami, I went on to colorofchange.org, which is the nation's largest civil rights organization. My job there was to launch um, the, the first online petition platform for Black people called Color of Change. Uh, uh, sorry, organizedfor.org. I had all these connections and, and amazing relationships with the folks that I made through my life life as an organizer. Um, you know, um, in fact, while this breastfeeding campaign was going on, that's when George Zimmerman was acquitted. And we all also like we also took over the <laughs> the state capitol um, in protest and, and occupied it for 31 days. So it was so much going on and going to going to color change was, was a great way to actually lean in more into the data and take the amazing playbook of digital tactics that they had created and literally putting it into hands of organizations and individuals all over the country. I mean, my first month there, we stopped the prison from being built in San Francisco. But either way, you know, I, I realized I had all these amazing experiences where I saw and was able to reclaim data, you know, in a liberatory way. Like our one of our slogans is data for black lives is data is protest, data is accountability, and data is collective action. I saw that. But at the same time, this is 2016 election, you know, there was also so much more awareness and realization around how data was being weaponized historically and in the present moment, right? Risk assessments, FICO credit scores, automated decision-making systems, predictive policing algorithms, right? And I realized, how do we change the culture around data? How do we reclaim data as a tool? And what does that look like? And putting my kind of organizer hat on, you know, I said, okay, I have, I know so many people in this world of activism and movement building, you know, who are working in cities all across the country, had been moving the needle in, in the trenches, pushing for a, in really important work. But I also know so, so many data scientists, mathematicians, folks I met in college, people in the tech space, my, you know, Lucas, who helped me start the organization, he was getting his PhD in math at MIT. And I said, okay, well, what would it look like for us to break down the silos between black communities and activist communities and data scientists and bring them together? And, you know, so I, you know, I had the idea for data for black lives and I said, well, let me experiment and see if this idea has traction. And um, we, you know, my litmus test was hosting this conference at MIT and, you know, once it sold out, I was like, okay, wow, like this is an idea whose time has come. This is something that people are really interested in. It's needed. And, you know, three years later, two sold out conferences. And I mean, I have to go back to our membership base, but about over 10,000 data scientists and activists and, and daily growing, you know, you know, hubs all over the country, work on Facebook accountability all the way to local work around big data in, in cities like Minneapolis. You know, it's amazing to see how how much we, we've been able to do. And most importantly, how we've been able to push data as a tool, right? And to really... Um, change the narrative and also empower people in a in, in an important way. And it seems like uh, the momentum has has just continued. And obviously, we're uh, recording this right now on on June third, which is uh, about a week and a half after May twenty fifth, which is uh, when George Floyd was murdered uh, in uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, protests have have come out and riots have come out across the country. Um, and we are seeing your organization being tagged quite a bit on on Twitter, and I know there's a lot of folks that are reaching out um, to you. And I'm wondering uh, right now how your organization is interacting with uh, the world around us, and also what questions you're kind of receiving from the public um, at Data for Black Lives. Yeah, that's a great question. I think. Um... In terms of how we're, re well, let's start with questions. I think it's exciting to see that people want to know how they can be involved 
in particular data scientists. It's, it's been exciting to be some part, part of some really important conversations that are even happening in Silicon Valley. I think people are ready to walk the talk <laughs> in a way that's important. I think it's great to see more and more folks from local communities and black communities being like, hey, how can we use data in an important way? But, you know, um, in terms of how we're responding, we're really building on work that we've been already doing in Minneapolis. I mean, I remember one of the first ideas, you know, when I was still even, ex everything that we've done has been like my little experiments around whether it's the conference or different programs. And I said, let me see what kind of, how we can be, like, how can we engage with groups locally? And one of the first things that we ever did was when folks from Minneapolis had reached out to me um, a couple, about a year and a half, a couple of years ago and said, hey, Yeshi, we're a group of educators, parents, students, researchers, and, you know, Ramsey County Sheriff Department, which is St. Paul's Sheriff Department, you know, St. Paul, Minneapolis or Twin Cities, the foster care agencies, the school districts, all of these different agencies and organizations had announced this joint powers agreement that would share data across the agencies for the purpose of creating risk ratios. People in the community may not know what algorithms or predictive analytics or big data necessarily is, but you know, we know that in the context of, you know, the school to prison pipeline in Minneapolis, Twin Cities, as I wrote in a Medium post, our, our solidarity statement is literally the fourth worst place for Black people to live because of inequality and a long history of that. You know, in the city where Philando Castile was murdered with impunity, like we know this is this is going to be negative. So I came down to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I helped community members like I, 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 I kind of translated a lot of it, reframed it, talk about risk, talk about risk ratios, talked about my experience, what at what what what, what being called at an at risk youth meant and how these these whether it's super predator myth and all these different ideas are now being baked into these algorithms and that totally, you know, propelled them into such amazing organizing and, and, and coalition building under the, um, they call the coalition, the coalition to end this uh, cradle of the prison algorithm, which I think is an amazing name. And they won, right? The city totally dissolved the plan. And I had been in connection with those leaders, brought them to our conference space. And now they are starting their own data for public good organization. And when everything started to happening, I immediately reached out and I said, hey, you know, how can we support what's going on? And, you know, whether it's doing a really targeted fundraising around making sure that some of the youth leaders have spaces there for healing, for organizing and for restorative justice, um, sending down, you know, um, reporters to go meet with them directly and talk about on the technology and the data side, but also on, on the education and police brutality side. But, you know, even yesterday, getting some good news that, you know, I, I get a call saying that they're all getting ready to go to a rally. And after five years of fighting, literally five over five years of fighting to get police out of schools, um, the, there was going to be a vote that day and getting a call later that evening saying, hey, you know, it was actually unanimous vote, um, you know, Minneapolis Public Schools um, and um, Minneapolis Police Department that you know have totally d dissolved and ended the contract. There'll be no, there'll, there'll be normal, normal police in Minneapolis public schools, and that just being like, okay, wow, right? You know, and I think for us, that's the model for our work, right? Like, I don't live in Minneapolis, but how do we, through data, through leadership development, through empowering people, through using our platform, through connecting them with data scientists? through, you know, we also have a hub there that's all data scientists that's working on different data projects. And we're going to have a movement pulse check next week where folks are going to talk more into detail. And I want to give, make sure that, you know, folks can go on a d4bl.org and sign up and then get, get on to that to speak. But yeah, you know, I think that's how for us, it's like supporting folks locally. In Atlanta hub, there's a lot going on, right? Where there's been so much, a lot of our hub leaders actually work for the CDC, they they're they're they've been bailing people out since COVID, right? And it's it's absolutely escalated. How do we support you know folks in terms of data, in terms of stuff around surveillance that's happening, but also in what kind of political strategy and data, like tactical data that can be used around demands, like getting you know the 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 mayor Keisha Bottoms to resign, right? Which is a big ask that folks are pushing. In Boston, there's a lot of different demands that are being up uplifted now. So 
that's how I'm seeing it. You know, our response being coordinated and it's all about us saying, yes, we're a national organization, but our focus is that, you know, I've always said that there's no national without local and how do we do that? And I think on a larger basis, it's right. How are we contextualizing this? You know, a lot of what's happening, yes, it's about these isolated, you know, examples and 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 and, and stories of police killings, but it's also, you know, just the everyday terror of extreme income inequality, like chronic poverty and erasure, right? And that's really what's going on. And that's why people are taking to the streets and that's why there's so much frustration. Um, it's also, I think, an opportunity for folks who had been doing this groundwork to really shift and move and to make move the needle on some and 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 when big victories are on ass, ask that that have been made for a really long time. So that's what we're focused on. As I said before, we're you know doing an open letter to tech companies, um, doing pu- public records requests around facial recognition uses in different cities. We know that people are using facial recognition even with masks on to track protesters. We also know that in Minneapolis Police Department, they're using contact tracing technologies to actually also track protesters. So our policy director and our research director are really on working on that too. So there's a lot going on. (laughs) But I think my main thing is, you know, how do we spread hope, but hope in a very concrete way of let's, we have to make this moment, whether it's COVID-19 pandemic or this moment of uprising about long-term social change and not just temporary reform. The letter that you wrote on uh, Medium, a statement of solidarity, is just so powerful. We'll make sure to to link to that and some of the other um, opportunities to connect with Data for Black Lives in the show notes for for this. But I do want to go back to that letter. um, And uh, there there is this this quote from Martin Luther King that's been um, making the rounds in the past week about riot being the language of the unheard. Um, And then you take it one step further and you ask, you know, if riot is the language of the unheard, what has America failed to hear? Um, And so I'm just going to take a second to let that question sink in because I think it's so pivotal to all the conversations that are happening right now. Um, And you do answer it in uh, the statement of solidarity, but I'm wondering while we have you here, if you would be willing to to speak to that question. Uh, What do you believe that America has failed to hear? Yeah, I think that America, I mean, what I liked about, I think it's great that people are sharing the quote, but I love the other context. This idea that there really are two Americas, (laughs) you know, that there's one America where there's immense opportunity, there's culture, there's education, there's... You know, I mean, I go on New York Times and I'm like, oh, interesting there. You know, I'm I'm hearing about awesome mobilizations on the ground in Houston where we've supported leaders there who are doing amazing ways of using evidence based policing as a subversive tactics to actually abolish, you know, and, and address the culture of policing. And, you know, but I'm going on New York Times and I'm seeing them talk about a guy who was in a, a meditation retreat for three months and he missed the whole pandemic and in and, and COVID. I'm like, really? You know, but like there's people who they they're so isolated from what's going on. Meanwhile, there's people who their daily life, as I said, is really defined by chronic unemployment, by this 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 real sense of frustration and 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 and, and despondence and des- and and despair that is the result of circumstances. And I think it's not like people haven't been talking about these issues for a very long time, right? I mean, as I said, I'm 30 years old, probably over half my life I've been talking about police brutality, police killing, state sanctioned violence. But, you know, I think there's a conversation around racism, there's a conversation around white supremacy and structural racism, but what are the ways in which, you know, not, you know, these, these, this has been, you know, baked into our culture, but, but, but what are the ways in which we found to just totally deny and to erase people's voices? And I think for us, that's why data has been really, really important, right? You know, you know, alone, we, we might be easily ignored, but there's power in a number, right? There's, we're seeing that there's power in a number on the streets. And certainly, you know, when we think about this idea of data as protest, there's power in us coming together and using it as a way, if we reclaim it to do such, and in the context of grassroots organizing and Black leadership, Black-centered leadership, it can be this powerful tactic. But, 
You know, and, and I think in that Minneapolis piece, I wanted to make very clear that structural racism and what's happening there isn't just that Black people are doing really bad. That's been normalized across the world and across the country in, in, in particular, but that no, while Black people there are doing really bad, bad, white folks have been doing really, really, really well. You know, like many, like Minnesota is, like, is has, has more Fortune 500 companies as its headquarters than any other state, right? People, white communities there make $17,000 more above the national average. You know, if you look at one of the graphs that I put, but based on this University of Minnesota study, there's currently no neighborhood that black people can actually afford to live in according to the medium, median income, right? And what, and that's crazy. And I think people, you know, yes, absolutely, you know, you know, I think George Floyd's death really, touched on, again, these like isolated incidents of police killings. Over 49 people since the year 2000 have been murdered with impunity by police, Black people in, in Minneapolis, but it also is reflecting this very long history of being erased, denied, completely ignored, right? And having to stand, as Martin Luther King says, on this isolated island of dealing with issues yourself and also just being blamed for them. And when I log into or when I click on the Data for Black Lives website and I make it to the homepage, this is d4bl.org, the first thing that comes up is data as protest, data as accountability, data as collective action. And that's some of the ways that you've spoken about how we can use data to create a more equitable world, which is the really positive side and positive use of data. But then there's also the other side of things and how data can be used to cause harm to a lot of different communities. And I'm wondering if you can maybe provide some specific examples of how data can be used or maybe is currently being used for political oppression right now. Yeah, I mean, there's so many examples in particular. Now, I mentioned some earlier, but I want to say this first. I think so many people are talking about abolish the police, defund the police. That's really important demands to make. But I don't believe that we can abolish or defund the police unless we abolish big data, which is the name of the book that I'm writing and working on. Also, the name of the lectures that I've been giving all year up until the pandemic. And the idea behind abolish big data is really grounded in abolition, which is part of the black freedom movement. And certainly, you know, the movement to end prisons and to make, you know, prisons have become the answer to social problems. Um, but also this like the original reform movement in this country, which is the movement to end slavery. But you know, abolish big data means to dismantle the structures that put the power of data into the hands of a few, um, but then to put it into the hands of people who need it the most, right? And I think people talk about policing and what we're really dealing with is a culture of policing, right? It's these institutions. Yes, it's the 88th precinct, which is near my house in, in Brooklyn. Yes, it's many, definitely, certainly Minneapolis Police Department and the White Supremacist Police Union there. But it's also a culture that seeped into schools, as I talked about in my school, where my school was a place of crime fighting instead of like learning. It seeped into the economy, right? And who gets opportunities and, 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 and who's barred from them. And I mean, just people's even daily experience of, of, of going into stores and like having to experience racism. But most importantly, it's really being seeped into technology. And I think, you know, no algorithm is neutral. No technology is neutral. But whether it's you know, facial recognition right now and how they're really doubling down on using it to track protesters. I mean, whether it's predictive policing, I, I was on an interview with a reporter yesterday and they asked me about IBM and Microsoft. I'm like, no, wait, IBM has been doing predictive policing since 1963. Microsoft has tried to kind of really position themselves as like the po predictive policing, you know, people like, like, company forever now, right? Like this is a big industry, right? Like Amazon, obviously with facial recognition, you know, and I think, you know, it's risk assessments, right? And I think what, you know, how, you know, and not only that, not only in the term of policing, but I think one of the things that we also talk about too, and as I really highlight in this article, in the Medium post is also economically, right? FICO credit scores, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that FICO, isn't, you know, some federal agency. I mean, I, I spoke on, at a congressional briefing and there are folks who were who there didn't realize that, right? Which is sad, but FICO is a fair and Isaac corporation and they're a private company that through a collusion of data brokers, TransUnion, Experian, and, and, and Equifax have so much power over people's economic lives 
where we have no recourse, no ability to change it. Maybe there's federal structures like the, the, the Consumer P Protection Financial Bureau, but for the most part, there's no recourse, right? I know families right now, especially in this pandemic, who cannot afford to rent a house and maybe are, are able, who are really hardworking and, and, and are able to like come up with a security to, deposit, but because of their credit score and the fact that they're black are being barred from safe and affordable housing, right? Like, like that's crazy. And I think, you know, how does that happen, right? How are these, how is it that zip code, which is one of the things, one of the main variables that's used in FICO credit scores, you know, becomes not only just a reflection of geographically where, where we live, but also a uh, reflection of generations of segregation that started in 1933 and certainly before that and is now baked into these algorithms and is perpetuated on a large scale basis, right? So I think, you know, there's a lot to be done around exposing algorithms and exposing bias, um, but also abolishing it, right? And that's what we talk about in this open letter to, to Facebook that I did. How can we make sure, you know, making demands on companies like Facebook or genetics companies like 23andMe that have done a lot of work to target Black communities for data testing and, and DNA testing because they need a bigger database to then sell this information to pharmaceutical companies? How do we make demands on them to hand over data, knowing that their bread and butter is our data? How do we establish structures like public data trust, right? Data cooperatives as a way for us to not just get individual value as Black people out of our data, but collective, right? You know, and I think that's the mindset shift that, that we're really pushing for. We don't see these tools as being neutral, but I know that data can be a tool depending on whose hands it's in, right? And I think I've seen that happen in my life and I've seen how powerful it was. And I think the time is now, right? Um, especially in this moment, um, you know, where we're really in a very visible way, I think for the first time ever, people are really seeing um, the other America, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, uh, so I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm a minister <laughs> and serving a congregation currently. And uh, the... Yeah, and and it's uh, it's a predominantly white suburban congregation, um, and folks are feeling hopeless. And I know it's like maybe even just like a, a microcosm of of white guilt and and all all of these things. But when you talk about things like you know redlining and police brutality and all of these things keep adding up, um, I think there's a lot of folks in white communities and many communities of like hopelessness and feeling ineffective and wanting to do something but not knowing what to do. Um, and so I guess the question is kind of two-pronged. The first is, like, how do we retain hope um, in this moment and move forward? And then the second is, you know, what, um, for folks who do want to do something um, from from any community, but maybe if you, there's any specific communities you want to speak to, uh, what, what do you recommend that people do right now? Those are great, great questions. And I love bringing in the aspect of faith and spirituality because I do think that that's really been able for me to be maintain my vision and to build my vision and to believe even when the current reality is telling me something totally different and, and facing like an extreme opposition, right? And I think, you know, what gives me hope is, you know, I feel blessed in the sense that I am connected to and I know people who are doing amazing work, right? It's, there's so much going on in Minneapolis right now. People's entire communities have, 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 have been burned down. People are feeling lost and hopeless. But to hear people say, we've actually fought for this for five years and we never thought this would happen. We fought to get police out of our schools in Miami and that hasn't happened yet, but I'm like, wow, like actually that's a win for everybody. And I guess for me, it's like, if you're not connected to these stories, I think, you know, you know, I mean, one of the things that, that, that we're trying to do is like trying to uplift them more, but you know, I think people can try to search them out. Right. But I think even more on a global level and like, you know, even more deeply, I think what this moment's calling us right now to realize is that, Again, a lot of these things have been happening under the surface. There is, there has been another America. There has been so there. There is a lot of chaos. There is a lot of change, and there's a lot of loss. But I, but I do feel like at first, all change does feel like loss. I feel like we're grieving a world and a way of living that we might have been comfortable with, or we might have been used to. But I think we have to 
I, you know, hope against hope, right? That, that what's coming after this and what's being born out of this moment is going to be something that's going to be different and powerful and beautiful. And yes, this is in the face of authoritarianism, militarization of police, but, you know, we have to believe that. And I think having that perspective and being grounded in that and being even grounded in love and gratitude right now is really important. I mean, so much stuff is happening helicopters flying, planes flying low, curfews. These are all kind of like fear and intimidation tactics. And we can't allow ourselves to ourselves to embody that. It's hard. Sometimes it means staying off of Twitter, <laughs> which I try to do. Sometimes it means, you know, whatever you have to do. But how do we not embody that? Like, And I, and I even said this during the um, 2016 election when all this stuff with Donald Trump, we have this person who's just spewing so much vitriol and it's so much polarization you know, I can't respond with the same spirit, right? Like, how can I respond with love and with grace and and with hope? And I know that in my position, I need to, right? Whether it's me on my team meetings and folks are feeling afraid and hopeless and sad, or whether it's me, you know, interacting with somebody that I'm on the phone with who's dealing with a lot of stuff who, again, is, is in a city where in Atlanta, they just locked up 600 youth, you know, and they're trying to bail them out, right? How do I, and, and, and I think there's a way to do it without obviously dismissing people's real feelings of grief, but also like holding space for that. And, 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 and also while just holding space for your own. And I'm going to be real, this kind of resilience and this kind of faith is a muscle I've had to build over the years, right? And I think that's in a lot of ways have what prepared me for this moment. But I think a big thing is, this fear and this intimidation, we cannot allow ourselves to embody it. And what people can do, I mean, I just listed some stuff, but you know, I think it's great that people are donating. I think it's great that people are, you know, um, trying to get involved. That folks, anybody, it doesn't matter if you're a data scientist or activist, whatever, please sign up for our movement. We have an online form. Um, we want to get folks plugged in in whichever way. Um, we have a newsletter that that, that people can read, but. What I always tell people is figure out what's going where you live, like what's going on where you live, right? I wrote in that Medium post, Minneapolis is a metaphor for our world. What's happening in Minneapolis and what has caused this worldwide uprising, probably some similar circumstances and conditions are happening where you live, right? And figuring out who are organizations, who what are groups that, are, that have been working on this, even if it's as simple as, you know, you're, you know, you, you Try to get linked up with a local youth organization that's working on school issues, right? Or police brutality. When we would go to the school board and talk about police brutality in schools or restorative justice, it made a difference to have community members there to support us at meetings and at actions, right? Like stuff like that really makes a difference. I think there's so many things that are happening no matter where you live. Finding and, and getting plugged into that is really important. I think in particular, for data scientists and other folks in, who are in our movement, figuring out like, what skills do I have that I can lend to bear? And most importantly, whether it's in volunteer spaces or trying to show up at a protest right now, centering and taking leadership from black people, you know, and making sure that that's always something that's happening, listening intently, learning how to decenter ourselves and to bring other, to uplift other people. I think that's really important. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but, you know, you know, I do believe that like care is the antidote to violence. I do believe that right now, yes, there is a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of frustration and anger and, and we have to air that. We have to address that. But it's also, you know, how do we respond with love? How do we create community right now? How do we hold space for people? Um, and one other practical thing, I see a lot of people posting like, oh, donate to... 10 of these organizations, find one organization and one thing that you really believed in and really push your folks to really donate, right? Like just find one thing. And I think that if people need ideas, go on my Twitter. There's a fundraiser that's going on right now with the, the folks who've been leading this fight in Minneapolis. What they're trying to fundraise for is not bail, right? Like bail is important and we need to get people out of prison. But what happens when folks are out of jail and what happens when the protests end? People need community spaces of healing, organizing, justice, restorative justice. And, you, you know, they 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 want to stipend youth, create spaces, you know, 
but build out programs um, that are youth led in the absence of mental health infrastructure, right? In the absence of churches and, and other services being open, you know, in a city where because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they had actually slashed a lot of important programs. So find one group that you really care about, that you've looked into and hopefully and 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 and, and that, you know, maybe isn't just a bail. A lot of these bail funds are saying that they are actually at capacity um, and like really pushing that right now if you are going to do online activism. Yeah. And for our listeners and anyone who's really looking to take action right now outside of signing up for the mailing list for Data for Black Lives or donating and outside of looking at the organization that is linked on your Twitter, do you have any other specific examples of groups, researchers or organizations who um, are just really important and impactful right now that people could benefit from looking into to get involved with? Yeah, I think, you know, there's just, there's really so many, I think I would have to ask people where they live, right? I think in every single city, I mean, let me see, you know, I and, and also what they're interested in. Hmm, how do I do this? I Yeah, like, I mean, you know, there's these big national groups. I mean, even for us, like I'm not pushing. You, yes, please, people donate to, 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 to Data for Black Lives. In fact, most of the funds that we're raising are going to lead res- rapid response efforts on, on the ground. I think a lot of other national groups are trying to say, hey, focus on local things that are happening. But, you know, supporting Data for Black Lives because we do support local organizing, um, but there's, you know, the group that I spoke about, Data for Public Good, that, that that's in Minneapolis, um, led by Marika Pfeffercorn and a whole amazing group of community leaders. Um, who else? Um, you, oh, th- there's so many. I think, um, you know, please, like if, if folks really want to know, we can have a conversation and I can put them in touch with folks where they live. I think that's the most important thing, because once this moment's over and once the protest ends, how do we really organize? Right. And it's it it really differs based on where you live and also what, you know, issues that are, that are really important to you. I think it's a more nuanced conversation. And I think that's at the heart of organizing. Right. How do we meet people where they're at? And how do we make sure that whoever we are and we're coming into these spaces that we're, you know, b- being plugged in in a way that's meaningful? So um, and that really depends on, on a lot of factors. So hope, sorry, I can't g- 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 give like here's the answer for everybody. But, uh, you know, I think that's part of organizing and, and movement building. It's, a, it's an iterative process and it's most importantly about relationship building. And, and that's how you uh, how you end your statement of solidarity as well is the statement you know I hope you can be a part of what we are building um, and I think even that simple statement is just so powerful that we're moving forward uh, together um, and so uh, for folks that do want to contact you in in particular um, is there a way that folks can be in touch with you Yeah we have a um, you know people can reach out on our info info at d4bl.org. We also have a forum on our website and I'm also on Twitter at Yes, She Can. I always laugh at my Twitter. Yes, She Can. And also the, the Data for Black Lives at Twitter. And I'm trying to stay off of Twitter, but I am still really on DMs because so many people are reaching out. And in particular, if you want to be a volunteer, again, you don't have to just be a data scientist or a software engineer. You can be an artist, a teacher. If you're, if, if, if you are a Black person or a black community leader or and just just wanting to be involved absolutely please sign up um that's a good place to kind of let us know what you're interested in and what skills you have what you want to learn about and i think for folks who, are, who want to be a little bit, bit more plugged into interacting with the community we have a facebook group as well that's just called data for black lives like group or whatever so yeah there's different ways right now yeah, I have to tell you, every time I see your Twitter handle, it puts a smile on my face. Oh, uh, really? I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's so clever. Um, but uh, <laughs> Yeshi, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to speak with us and speak to our community today. It really means a lot. Thank you. We again want to thank Yeshi so much for joining us for today's episode. And again, want to name our support of Data for Black Lives as they use data science to create concrete and measurable change in the lives of Black people. Normally during this time at the end of the episode, Jess and I do a brief debrief of the episode, but for today's episode, we actually want to let Yeshi's words speak for themselves. For more information on today's show, please visit the episode page at RadicalAI.org. 
And if you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Join our conversation on Twitter at RadicalAIPod. And as always, stay radical. Radical.